And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us straight from, coming to us straight from... The, from from the realm of Maximum Apocalypse and Be and Beta Red here in the temple, now coming back with the few and cursed role playing game using the Maximum Apocalypse system, the one and only R Scott Ols. How you doing today, man? Hey, I'm doing pretty good. Pretty good today. So, ah. Uh -huh. It's been, I'd say it's been about a, it's been about a year or so since I had you on for bit for Beta Red. Uh, yeah, have you been yeah. up in the interim? So I've been doing pretty good. Like in the interim time, after finishing Beta Red and like getting it distributed, um, I basically kind of was like, kind of in between. We worked on, we actually were working on Fusion Curse for a little bit. Um, we'd originally planned to go to Kickstarter with it in June or July. I can't remember when, but somewhere around that time. Uh, but we realized we weren't quite ready for it yet, so we pushed it back to October. So we was like, there was like finishing up that and then gearing up for this Kickstarter. I was working on it. I dropped off like the the rules in January with the other guys, and that's what I've been doing basically, just sort of testing and running that and doing a few other things here and there with people. Running some games on my stream, my Twitch channel, and stuff. Yeah, that's what I'm mm -hmm. up to. So, with the few, with the few, and with um the few and curse. Now, I've known about it as I've known about the indie comic for a, for a bit of time, and being an indie comic that takes place in the weird west is certainly going to be appealing to me as a longtime Deadlands player. Yeah. Um, uh, but. How did you how did you guys come across the few and cursed and what what gave you the prompting to want to do a role playing game based on it? Well, the few and cursed uh, partnership between uh, Felipe and Mike from Rock Manor Games actually occurred before I was even on the scene with those two. They were I think it was the third issue of the comic and the Maximum Apocalypse board game were on Kickstarter at the same time, mm -hmm. and they were someone had like. Someone had dropped mention of it, I think, to either Mike or Felipe, one of the two. They'd found out about the other one. And so they they actually started talking through like Kickstarter and decided to do like a um a collab kind of thing. So there's a card for the gunslinger character in uh, the Maximum Apocalypse board game that is if you bought it through Kickstarter, it is actually read from the comic books. So it's got a slightly different because like in the in the board game, if you're unaware, the Maximum Apocalypse board game has um, two different gender cards for each of the archetype, each of the roles. Mm -hmm. And so there's a male gunslinger that was like the base set that was originally supposed to be created. And then there's a female version, which is read from the Fion Curse comics. Um, so it has slightly different abilities and the slightly different things when it interacts with the other cards. Uh, so they actually had been working together on that. And then that led to their creating of the Few and Cursed uh, board game later. But by that time, I was on the scene. And I was actually thinking when we were working on Maximum Apocalypse of like, releasing it with a couple of settings sort of guidelines in the in the game master guide and one of them that i had thought of was the few and cursed uh world because i uh, was also a backer of the kickstarter uh for the comics and stuff and i was following along and so felipe because we were at origins that very first year i was there too and i was in the airbnb and felipe was there and i was like hey what would you think about like if we did this official setting for Maximum Apocalypse? And he, at the time, was actually not into the idea. But after the board game, he had spent more time at gaming conventions and was thinking, oh, maybe we could do an RPG of Few and Cursed. And so this was sort of the he came back. He came back to this table, and I reapproached him. Essentially, we had like this. Hey, he's like, you know, I'm open to the idea now. I'm like, great, I've got all these ideas. Uh, but we came to this this sort of um, compromise where the Few and Curse RPG is a, like a standalone game, but uses the same system as Maximum Apocalypse, so it like links right in. So if you're already playing Maximum Apocalypse and stuff, you can just you can just borrow the setting essentially, and then you know change up whatever you need to change up to get your players from the one to the other, essentially. Mm -hmm. Now, I ended up asking this 
around the t- around the time that the Maximum Apocalypse um, RPG was ki- was being kickstarted. But would it be fair of me to assume that foreknowledge of the of the comic of the board game is not going to be that that much of a requirement? You could somebody could go into this role playing game with not much um, issue. Yeah. So we, um, I've actually play tested with both people that are aware of the RPG and then people that are not, or I mean the uh, comic books and people that are not aware of the comic books. Um, and it, it plays exactly the same. The, like having the foreknowledge of the comics gives you some insight into the world. So you might have more, like a better understanding of like the lore of the world. But otherwise, like the game master could do whatever with whatever. Um, because a lot of the stories for the monsters anyway revolve around cursed objects, and we have we have some cursed objects, right? Because we we know about them from the comic books, and so I got those, and I was like, here's what I think they would look like as far as gamifying. And then Felipe was like, yeah, and here's some other ones that we haven't released yet, but probably will. Or these are from the board game; you could probably use these too. And we just basically created these, but then we made the, like in that process was like, okay, what are the guidelines to do that so that Game masters can do whatever they want and have all kinds of different cursed objects. So having a foreknowledge of the comic book would help you understand that there's these cursed objects and that there's this lore around them. But otherwise, you don't have to know anything um, because it's just a, it plays out like a traditional RPG. Like there's a thing happening, there's some bandits, there's uh, all of a sudden a monster that rolls through. Like it's all going to play out exactly the same. So having read the comics or not, it still plays the same. And at the table. It actually was a, I think, in one of the play tests that I ran, it was actually a hindrance for one of the players that he had read the comics. So he actually had like a moral dilemma about dealing with the fact that everyone is getting killed by a giant bird creature um, because he knew more about that bird creature and and was like, I don't know if I want to attack it. So it actually turned out to be a detriment for him. And like people were like, but you've got to save us. We're all dying. So. Yeah, having a foreknowledge uh, is is not really going to be required to play the game at all. Mm-hmm. And since you mentioned cursed objects and the importance of them in the other mediums, are there plans within the within this book to inc- to include some guidelines for GMs to create their own? Yes, that's exactly what the section is about. Um, there's a few that are listed as ex- like we have the some of them as examples, but the section isn't about these are the cursed objects. The section is, this is what cursed objects are, and this is how they work, and this is how you, like, what the corruption costs you put on them based on what they do. Um, and that's what the section is actually about. And then here's some examples, right? So that's mm-hmm. more of how it works out. Now, taking that into account, when when introducing the few in curse, to, especially, with, especially with testing the role-playing game, what's the elevator pitch you tend to give people? I tend to give people the elevator pitch of uh, this is a a Wild West setting that has been stuck without water for the last 70 years. So it is full of people trying to survive this sort of weird apocalypse with all of these crazy things happening. But then also there's this dark energy out there contained within objects that people can obtain to try to survive and have that strength. But unfortunately, the more of those that you have or even just having them in general corrupts your soul to the point where you become a monster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's basically the, the really fast pitch. Um, but we do play with that. Mm-hmm. So in like, like, you know, there's the, if you've looked at the maximum pop up stuff, you know, there's a section about like transforming into stuff. If you take too much radiation damage or too much like Z virus or whatever. Um, I rolled with that idea, but with corruption in this case, where if you have too much corruption, if you take like, your character could probably handle one cursed object, maybe, depending. Uh, but if they take a second one, they are most certainly going to become a cursed creature. Uh, and so that that is not a thing where you become an NPC. You actually are now a playable cursed creature. Mm-hmm. So that's another aspect of the game where you, you, can, you can transform into a monster every now and then to help you out or be a detriment to your party. Mm-hmm. I'm ge- and I'm guessing turning into a monster is m- is much like trying to work with the Hulk. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And like there was actually, a, a, we just did a game with Quackalope a couple of nights ago, which will be available for people to watch relatively soon after this interview sometime. Um, but we we had a moment in that where the uh, one of the characters was using his special ability that 
like forces cursed creatures to like change and like you know basically like a like a, a turning the undead kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was using his his ability to do that. Well, what he didn't know was that one of the other players was also a cursed person. They had a they had a cursed object that had surpassed their corruption, and they they were just suppressing the monster. Mm-hmm. So so I had the player make a resolve roll to keep the monster suppressed, and it failed. So suddenly, one of the players turned into a cursed monster who only knew that this this person was hurting them. And so there was like a sort of a PvP kind of thing happening where all of a sudden one of the players was trying to kill another one of the players, but not in like human form, but in like a monstrous form. Mm-hmm. So that was pretty fun to, to play with. Now, I, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you recall, but, a, but a, a long time ago, I did do a review of Maximum Apocalypse. And yeah. one of the things, some of the stuff I said is that it's some. Um, uh, I made a, I made an analogy to it to it being a retro clone, which um, don't ask don't ask me to exp, don't ask me to explain where my head was at when I said that because I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> but one of the things I brought up is how, is how the ans, the answer to what sort of apocalypse maximum apocalypse is is yes, and now we right. we t- you take that. And now you're transferring it over to a, to a game where where you where because where you have a specific setting. You don't have a contem- you don't have a contemporary world kind of um, yeah. pseudo setting. Mm-hmm. Um, what kind of things have to what kind of things had to change to accommodate the fact that you're dealing with a specific setting, both in um, in narrative, but also in mechanics. Yeah. Well, so I I don't uh, so I had this sort of joke that rolls around with Maximum Apocalypse where I don't really like when there's only one apocalypse thing to roll with. I call the minimum apocalypse games, right? Um, and I have the maximum apocalypse, as it were. <laughs> uh, so that was like that was a thing that I had to like get over in my head. Like I can't hold that over myself. Like there's one there's one sort of apocalypse thing happening in this comic setting and I'm working within the constraints of that intellectual property. So I had to just sort of narrow that down. But what that meant then was that there was more opportunity to focus on that setting in that world in in the book space, right? Because I don't have to explain a bunch of of different monsters necessarily or a bunch of different like setting situations because i'm really just explaining the one and once i've done explaining it then i then i can focus on things like places and groups and so it was a little bit easier in that regard to to focus on more of the stuff people might want to know like what factions should i use for bandits or like um notable locations or or you know maybe Maybe in this weird post-apocalyptic place, are there any places that have created a government like that kind of stuff? And we could we could actually expand that information because we had the space to do so. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a narrative change. Mechanically, I had to figure out a way to still have the character creation work similarly, where you have these choices that affect your stat numbers and your special abilities. And what I ended up kind of doing was. And this is where the compromise between like it being its own game and it being an expansion happened. And what I did was instead of in like Maximum Apocalypse where you create a character, you have 25 in all of the stats starting off. Mm-hmm. I automatically assumed that this was one of the personal apocalypses. And so I gave a, a 5 to one stat, a 10 to another, and a 5 to another stat. And that would be how you would link it in to the Maximum Apocalypse rules. You would just call this like cursed setting the apocalypse scenario for your personal mm-hmm. apocalypse and then just roll with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was one way to sort of set that in, but then I still wanted there to be options. So we, we were like, well, what, what would the other things be? And so the mechanical thing was we still kept the option of choosing uh, like your archetypes. That was easy enough. No change needed there. Um, Cause we just, just roll, we just change up the archetypes to match the, the setting, but then we still have the, this adds a plus to this and a minus to that. So that totally worked fine, uh, but it was that second that personal apocalypse for maximum apocalypse thing that we had to figure out what to do. And when I was talking to Felipe, he was actually he's the uh, creator of the comic book and writer, 
um, he was actually the one that had the uh, the solution. And he was he was saying, well, you know that these people in this world won't survive just one way. They all have different ways of surviving. Like some roll and like lean into their faith. Some lean into the dark arts. Some lean into like banditry. And I was like, hey, can I just like come up with like you just gave me three, but can I come up with like the rest of them and see how you feel about them? And so I did. I came up with this whole list of them, and then we basically went and like crossed off ones that he didn't like, and you know circled the ones he did like, um, and just like you know, chose what these different focuses would be. And then it worked out exactly the same because then we had the same kind of thing where you choose your two archetypes, then you choose your survivor focus, which is like your personal apocalypse. And there were some constraints for that. It's not as, as open as it would be, but it is, it does then push you right into the story the same way it would for maximum apocalypse. So that was, those are the two, that was, that was a mechanical change and a narrative change that we worked on. Mm-hmm. Now, with that in mind, what could you get? Could you give me a bit of a short list of the uh, of the archetype list? Sure. Uh, exactly. Four of you cursed. Yeah, I probably should have had that like fully open, but I didn't. Uh, so the few and cursed archetype list is going to have. Um, hold on. Let me just open it for you, and I should, like I said, I should have the document open, but I didn't. And that really the way you the way you described it, it sounds like there's a slightly different list of 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 archetypes compared to Maximum Apocalypse. Yeah, there are some that are exactly the same because there's like a priest is a priest regardless of what year it is, right? Um, so we just that one stayed the same with some some modifications or changes based on the fact that there are now cursed creatures. Uh, so like there's an there's a special ability um, like banishing which which actually changes that's the like the turn in the undead sort of feature that I was mentioning before mm -hmm. uh, but it it sort of pushes the 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 it gives disadvantage to the the cursed creature but if the person continues to banish for the next like action phases and so on the creature has to make these resolve rolls and if they fail it then they turn back into their human form which changes up all of their stats and it makes them vulnerable again and things like that. Like it's hard to catch a giant snake, right. And grab it and hold it down. It's much easier to catch a, you know, five foot nine dude. Mm. Right? <laughs> These are different things, but essentially the, the, the archetypes that are in this game are uh, assassin, blacksmith, curse chaser, doctor, uh, farmhand, gunslinger, which stayed the same for maximum apocalypse, minor, uh, outlaw, Priest, which stayed the same, and and scholar. Mm -hmm. um, there's some similarities. An assassin is essentially similar to the hunter from Maximum Apocalypse. A blacksmith is kind of like a mechanic. Um, the farmhand is is similar to the veteran because the veteran, if you remember, has like the the um, loyal companion, and so the farmhand has the same kind of thing, right? So they mm -hmm. have the same sort of deal. And then, like, uh, uh, the miner and the firefighter are very similar in many ways. Like, they both use kind of explosives. They both use, like, heavy pickaxe type, you know, axe type things. Um, so those are very similar. So there's a few similarities between them, but then there are some differences. Like, like I said, the, the priest has a new ability that replaced another one that's specific to this thing. And the curse chaser, um, while it has very similar stats to, like, the ronin, it has the special abilities are very specific to this setting. Um, mm -hmm. So everyone's abilities are very specific to the the setting itself. Yeah. Now, taking that taking that into account, did um. Now I'm guessing because of the fact that you that you have one that you have one apocalypse. Um, yeah. Which which we already covered that that answers that. Yeah. So I'm guessing the. I'm guessing that survival focus fills the role of what would have been personal apocalypse in maximum apocalypse. Yeah. So the survivor focus is what we call it in few and curse. It, it was, it replaces the personal apocalypse section. And then there's like 11 or 12. I can never remember how many I chose for maximum apocalypse. Cause we added a few during the Kickstarter when we had like some stretch goals. Mm -hmm. Um, but like there's like eleven personal apocalypses, uh, but in the survival focus there's actually only seven uh, survivor focuses uh, because that's what it like when we like I said when we narrowed it down it kind of like well these two sound exactly the same or very similar so let's not do that um, 
but they, they, they it fills that same role. So you would choose like your your primary and secondary archetypes based on those archetypes, and then you would choose your survival focus because you're only surviving one apocalypse, this cursed world. But you might survive it with banditry, or you might band together in communities with other people. You might uh, try to do the dark arts and like learn how, how cursed objects work and try to obtain them. Uh, maybe it's your faith. Maybe it's just foraging where you're just like a water hunter. You just hunt for water. Maybe it's grit. Uh, maybe it's soldiering. Maybe you're, you know, part of the militia or whatever. Or maybe it's treasure hunting where you do also know about cursed objects, but instead of trying to gain their power, you sell them for money, for water, uh, to the people who want those that power. Mm-hmm. Now... Now you had mentioned earlier about the about the idea of cursed individuals being able to trans being able to um, transform. How this can be a, if you'll pardon the pun, given that we're talking about a wild west game, wild card. Yeah, uh, I'd like you to go into detail on to, on how on how on how that works and how how far someone could push it before they'd um, lose control of that character. Yeah. So it actually can be pushed pretty far depending on the character and the stats that you've put into the character. So the corruption stat is this sort of static number very similar to some of the other static numbers that are derived stats. That is the amount of corruption your character can take before there's too much corruption. Now each each a bit of corruption that they take will create this sort of mark of corruption. So maybe it's something like their shadows out of sync with their body or their eyes glow red or whatever weird thing is happening because they have this cursed object, um, which we see bits of in the comic. I didn't come up with that. Like you, you can see these things in the comic book. It's a part where red's eyes are shining because she can see in the dark and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so like this, this corruption threshold is the amount of, of just dark, dark energy from these cursed objects that you can take before you have to worry about becoming a monster. So if you've built your character fairly strong in that category, which is a a drive stat, then you would have a high number. And I think I've made a few pregens that have like 14. I I don't think I've ever really pushed it past 14 because it is a number divided by 10. So like it's going to be hard to get higher than like 15 in that corruption stat. And like some of the items have a corruption cost of 12 right so one will basically destroy all that 14 and you can't really take another one on um and so that that that's just balance wise but you once you've passed that threshold once you've surpassed that your character has to make these uh resolve rolls which is your mental capacity to be able to keep the monster at base you're going to keep using your resolve to push it down and hold it back Unless you choose to just let it go. And so you can just be like, I'm not going to hold it back. I, I opt to become the monster for this. Like you're like everyone's we're losing this fight or uh, this guy's really pissing me off in the saloon here. I'm just going to turn into my thing and, you know, chew him down. Um, and some of the cursed creatures are pretty badass. Some of them are not as badass. Like zombies are less badass than, say, a crow or um, something that is incorporeal that only becomes corporeal when they attack, and therefore they're basically like can't be hit with damage unless they're attacking, and then it's got to be this like repost like defensive response to to damage them. Mm-hmm. Um, so some of them are cooler than others, and and the way that the monster is determined is essentially based on the game master's decision, uh, which we call trail master in this game, and the player's decision. So working together. It's to do that. And either it's created, like it's determined pre in advance when you made your character. You're like, I would like this to be my monster, um, and the, and it was approved by the game master. Or it's based on the item. Like I, I just obtained a crow coin. I'm pretty sure that I'm going to become a crow, right? It's like, all right, cool, that's fine. We can do mm-hmm. that. And then here's here's the crow stats, right? So we know that when you become a monster, you're going to be this monster. Um, but anyway, they hold it at bay with the resolve rolls. And then once they are the monster, in order to turn back into a human, they again have to succeed on the resolve roll. So if you um, have, oops, I don't know what just happened, something on my computer. Uh, if you have a uh, character who has a fairly strong resolve, then you might be able to control that pretty well. But I'm gonna point this out that you're probably not gonna have a strong resolve and a high corruption unless you've done a very specific build. 
but then I guarantee you, you're kind of a glass cannon. You're going to be weak in a lot of other things. <laughs> so in, the, in so, those kind of in those kind of builds, you really would be Bruce Banner and the Hulk. <laughs> yes, exactly. Like you would have like a kind of role you do when you're not the monster, but like everyone would expect you to turn when things got hairy, right? Like that's although that's it. Although given the given the given the tech level and the subject matter, maybe I should be using the analogy of Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde. Yeah, 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 right. Very much tempting so. to use a, to use a werewolf, but prob- the problem is werewolves tend to, tend to be beefy, even in, even in their human forms. Well, and and you know these cursed objects too. Just to clarify something, these cursed objects aren't just things that have the dark energy, and then you become a monster. So you're just holding onto them so that you become a monster. That's that's not exactly the whole reason. Like the cursed objects themselves contain this power. And as we know from the comics, for those that have read them and those that are not familiar, we'll just explain. In the comic books, we know that these these cursed objects have intrinsic power. They do offer something to the person who has them. And so in the game, we ran with that eye idea. And so when you have something like a crow coin, you gain a special ability from the coin. Now, regardless of whether or not the coin is corrupting you to the point where you become a crow, you still have a new or an extra special ability that that you have only because you have that object. So the for the crow coin, just a spoiler, uh, the crow coin grants you the the uh, free movement action. It grants you the ability to move as a free action during combat, like mm-hmm. as, as one free action. So you get an additional movement essentially because you possess a crow coin, regardless of whether or not it's past your, your threshold. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to become the crow to move faster. You just do because you have the coin. So there's like this benefit to having these cursed objects as well and so if you you like it's like a game of like this is a game here so having a cursed object gives you something but it corrupts you and does it corrupt you too much Mm -hmm. and one little thing that we've been that i've been playing with with some of the adventures the primitive adventures that we are going to release with this book are things like okay this cursed object has a curse of two but each time it does a thing that goes up by two so eventually its corruption just continues to grow until eventually it is well beyond your ability to hold it back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that—that's the reason. That's the reason why why I asked uh, about stretching it because, um, whenever whenever you have some sort of limit, some sort of limited resource, especially one that can be threat that can be threatening to a player, yeah, um, you can easily end up with. What 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 we what we here in the temple like to call the ninety nine mega elixirs problem or the rainy day paradox. Mm-hmm. Um, if you've if you've played any if you played any RPGs, it's we call it the ninety nine mega elixirs because of the people who would hold on to who, who would hold on to mega elixirs for for just in case they need it, and mm-hmm. still have that mindset up when they're up against the final boss of the campaign. Yeah, right. Right. Oh. Or or those pe- or the people who have that who have that one potion and keep holding on to to it even when even when everybody else is fighting the bee beg. Mm-hmm. The point is is that there's a, there can be a tendency to be very very conservative with um a limited resource. Yeah, for sure. Oh. Uh, and now when it comes to the it sounds like there is it sounds like there isn't a set a set relation between um between types of cursed creatures and marks of corruption no um, do you have within the book do you have do you plan on having a section that covers sample marks of corruption to give gms ideas i know they're called trend masters but i go with gms just to keep oh yeah no, it's, it's totally fine uh, yeah, so there's uh, a section that we have where we talk about the the marks of corruption, and I have like there's like ten of them that are like example like things like you suffer from a rattling cough that never seems to ever get better, your eyes are constantly bloodshot, etc. Um, you become averse to any holy symbol and are repelled by them. Uh, these kinds of marks of corruption are, are examples that we listed there, and then it's also like there's also the thing of like how do you tone corruption, right? What mm-hmm. do you do to get rid of it? Um, 
and then and then it goes into what what does it being a monster look like right Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's absolutely part of the section uh, because I believe in the the concept of like not just telling game masters this is what you're going to do, but like giving them the toolbox and say this is kind of what we were thinking about. So you can use these as examples, but feel free to build your own. You know? Yeah. Because like I'm sure someone's going to be super creative and come up with something that I never thought of, and that's going to be really cool. <laughs> well, obviously, but I but. Even even though people will do will do that, giving people giving GMs guidance never never hurt anybody, right? And right, exactly. I've I've um I've been very I've been very critical over the years of games that re- that rely very much on a guide damn it or or um or swim da- or swim damn it philosophy with these kind of things. Um, yeah, it's that in actual in actuality it's the big. Is the big reason why, unlike some of my colleagues, I never got in bed with fate, because yeah. fate does a really bad job of of de- of the ter- of giving suggestions for aspects. Well, fate core does. Some of the games that are based off of fate do a better job. Like Tiancha does a good job with it. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, a lot, a lot of times it'll give it'll give like a paragraph description about what a high concept, what a trouble is, and and then and then a few examples and. And ha- and tell you to figure out the rest. Um, I liken this to someone's idea of teaching a, a person how to swim by bringing them to the edge of the deep end of the pool, pushing them off, and just say, "Okay, now drown less." <laughs> yeah. I mean, are you are you t- are you teach are you teaching them to swim? I guess. <laughs> you're. But um, that a lot of good it's gonna do is gonna do when they're drowning, right? Right. And I remember how St- I remember how Stanley had said that every comic is someone's first, and to an extent, I think that can apply just as well with RPGs. Absolutely. Oh. Now, with the, with that in, with that in mind, I, I I of course did notice that a lot of the. A lot of the a lot of the salvage rules and a lot of the a lot of the um, health health and condition rules are lar- are largely unchanged. Um, yes, that is correct. I may I may have asked this the when I had you on about Maximum Apocalypse, but have has anyone have, have you or anybody else ever tried to run a um, hex crawl with the few and cursed? A hex crawl. Uh, no one, none of the play tests have been of a hex crawl. No. Yeah, because I could easily see someone trying to do a a um, apocalyptic version of the Oregon Trail with with this one, where you have even where dysentery is the least of your problems. Sorry, couldn't resist. <laughs> yeah. But. And to the to that end. Um, I'm guess I'm guessing that you're going to be including some rules regarding regarding vehicles because well people are going to want to ha- people are probably going to want to have the fantasy of of a group of a party and of a party in a wagon for sure yeah there's um, wagons so a lot of the vehicles or or chase rules um, involve animals mm-hmm. um, because you know even a wagon is going to be pulled by something. Uh, and so there's there's m- more about like ho- there's horseback wagon combat for sure right I've got that section uh, because because driving no longer exists as a skill in that it's essentially just the same as an animal can roll um, which leads into a very interesting situation where you have a character who's like well why do I even need animal can well do you intend to run any carts or anything because you're gonna need to be able to control the animal. Um, and so that's what we did. Uh, so yes, there is a section on wagon combat and like example, horseback combat and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, but for like, if you wanted to blend it to with, with maximum apocalypse, because, um, you can right? the, the crafting rules are in there. They're in both games, but like, you know, for more uh, elaborate vehicles or like, Oh, I want to make some kind of steampunky type, you know, thing you the rules in few and cursed are they don't really cover 
that. I mean, there's the crafting rules, but they don't really cover like weird stuff as much. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's also where you would be able to pull from the maximum pockets rules because like crafting is very similar, but it's like got more examples on things like, um, you know, power generators or or like engines and stuff, right? So you'd be able to pull from that list of things and and how that would work for crafting and in automobile in few in or in maximum pockets, you could easily just port those rules over because they're similar. Um, in few and curse to make like a steampunky type thing mm-hmm. uh, easily. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's already there, right? It's already, it's all already exists. Mm-hmm. Now, given the, given the way that maximum apocalypse as well as few and curse as an aside up, if you can, if you continue this whole campaign setting thing, I, I, I hope you end up coming with a name for the, for the sit for the system. I'd say apocalypse engine, but that sounds way too much like powered by the apocalypse. Yeah, that's that's. Uh, I think it's actually um, taken already. Honestly, um, pro- probably ma- probably maximum one hundred. Just something so that it so that I don't have so so that it's e- so that's easier than saying powered by maximum apocalypse role playing game. Um, but given the given the kind of rule of five with with action phases and initiative. Um, what sort what sort of ways do you do you when when playtesting um expedite that pro- that process expedite the process of i i think i missed the question of oh. um, of um of calculating initiative since the way oh. it ends up going is um initiative is initiative is generated and then additional phase work r- runs on that rule of minus 5 yes so it's exactly the same in Few and Curse. It's the it's a static derived stat based on your agility and your instinct, mm-hmm. um, and then from there each action phase. Uh, so this uh, a combat round is broken into four action phases, and each action phase costs you five initiative. Um, but so do certain actions like full dodging or reposting cost some initiative points. Mm-hmm. And then uh, some some things or abilities might grant you additional. Uh, uh, initiative essentially for a few rounds so then you'd have this sort of playing back like if you were to do a thing or like where you get like some adrenaline or if you uh drink some coffee right before the fight then you probably have a little bit of a boost for Mm -hmm. a little bit right like that kind of thing um so there is that it's the same sort of thing where it breaks down in in time wise based on these points of initiative so the higher your initiative stat the more turns you'll have in a combat round Mm mm-hmm and when it when it when it comes to play testing, obviously the, obviously you've you've had a few people who are familiar with familiar familiar with the comic, familiar with um, Maximum Apocalypse, and what yeah. Um, what were what were what were some of the things that pe- that people took to easily, and what were some of the things that you that people um took to had had to unlearn some habits about in your in your experience with uh with few and curse um it wasn't there wasn't um a lot of crazy things that happened because i was like i've already done a lot of testing like with maximum pockets before we before we launched it so um there that is one thing that I didn't worry about so much or I didn't have to worry about as much because even when I when I put it down in front of people if they already knew the max box system they just jumped right in they had no problem mm-hmm. if they didn't then I still had to explain the same system uh, to them that I had to explain for maximum pop so um, there were no special new snags for the situation aside from potentially there being less uh, firearms to choose from because it's not a modern setting um, so there's like the 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 while there's still a lot of firearms there they all kind of break down into the same kind of thing so everyone just has peacemakers instead of like a bunch of different thousand different handguns right mm-hmm. um but oh. uh be funny but, as hell I mean, if somebody had a mare's leg yeah i mean i have a few like there's actually a couple of different options but they're like the same way with maximum pockets they're they're more of a category than an actual specific gun right Mm -hmm. and so if uh, if the trail master or whoever wanted to have some changey so a few 
stat differences here or there based on a particular type of gun that they wanted to showcase or a player wanted to showcase, then that's totally fine. It mm-hmm. just falls into a category and then you can work from there. Um, but for, for Maximum Apocalypse, like some of the snags that people run into because they're used to more traditional games was the idea of having a turn that like like a combat round isn't this thing that like, okay, I did my actions and then everyone else did their actions and that's the whole round. Um, so like this, this actually happened, uh, the other day when I was running this at, uh, one of the, at Rose City Comic Con, somebody had thrown like a, a thing that was like a dynamite, like a thing that they were expecting to go off and it didn't. And they were confused because the rules are set in, in the system that a thing like that will then like go off at the end of the combat round. So there was still like things happening which gave some of the antagonists the ability to move away from it before it went off. Some were still there by it when it went off, so it wasn't like a complete loss. Um, but like it was like, okay, and now that the turn is over, now that we're done with the actual combat round, now it goes off. Um, mm-hmm. And then they're like, oh, okay, that's that's how the timing makes sense. So some some learning curve in that regard um, to like, okay, well, you know, w- waiting to throw it on your last turn of the com- of of the combat round was probably your better option in this case, mm-hmm. um, uh, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, but also like holding holding actions. Uh, everyone knows how to do it, but people don't know how to do it when you have a breakdown in time structure like this. People are really confused. Um, so that's something to teach. But but mostly it's thinking tactically. Um, games like games like Mac like uh, um, like Five E don't require you to think super tactically about stuff. Whereas a game like Shadowrun or like Maximum Apocalypse rewards you for trying things a little differently. Mm-hmm. Um, because there's no attack of opportunity thing, you can just go like, I don't have to stay here and whack on this guy. I can literally duck, run, go somewhere else, and then have advantage because I'm on higher ground or something else that grants me like a more dice, like a better die to try to shoot them or try to throw something at them. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's the, like, like teaching people that there is some activity to do, especially in the system where there's defensive actions. I think that's the thing that people get hung up on the most. When I attack you in maximum apocalypse or in few and cursed, you don't just stand there and take it. You do something about it, right? You parry Mm -hmm. it, you dodge it, you something. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that was actually, I think, that and thinking tactically about what can I do instead of just standing here and letting a dude whack, whack on me while I go, I don't know, I can't hear it back because I'm terrible at that. Mm-hmm. Um, those are the two things that I had to break people of for both Maximum Apocalypse and Few and Curse that are new players to the system that haven't encountered Maximum Apocalypse before. Yeah, I can, I can, um, I can certainly get behind that, uh, especially, especially since I'm, I'm for I've. I find I find that content, that contested combat is far more interesting is far more interesting to me than um, than what than one sided. Yeah. Yeah, and I know people will like because I've had this I've had this debate several times, right? People will then counter me and go, "Well, your armor class number is a number that's based on your abilities and your ability to like dodge and your ability to parry and these defense." And I'm like, I get that. If- Okay, if that's but you're the case, a narrative situation. <laughs> explain if, the number. If that's the case, um, this brings a, this brings me to a paradox I've been poking fun at for as long as I've been doing this. Um, if armor class is supposed to represent your ability to dodge, why do, why does why does heavier armor present higher armor? Give you a higher armor class. Anyone has anyone ever tried to dodge and plate? Yeah. <laughs> right. Right, I'm like you can you can tell me this story that we've built up around the idea of armor class, but I'm not even worried about that because I'm worried about the actual like interaction. Like it, what is the the actual thing that I as a player am doing at this table when the the game master tells me your the thing over there is clawing you, right? Like do I what do I do? And the answer is, I sit there and wait for that person to roll the die and tell me whether or not it beat that magic number that I have a narrative story about. Well, the the other thing is that um, when you consider how that nar- how that narrative goes, if if they if they fail the die roll, 
it's treated as they as they missed somehow. Yes. Uh, not that not that you got out of the way or not or not that or not that you managed to to do the to do the classic blade catch, which which um, pro tip don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, is as cool as as cool as it may look in samurai films. Don't fucking do it. But it's they miss, not that you got out of the way or you caught it or you managed to blo- or you managed to block it. It's right. that they missed. Right. The wording on this is crucial. Yeah, because because a critical failure, right, on that thing also resolves around them getting hurt or losing a weapon or something, right? Mm-hmm. It's not about the critical failure is you did something super cool. It's that they did something super wrong. Yeah, for all for, and I know some some people will say that that they could that you could that a GM or the player could na- could narrate that kind of thing. But sure. if if not if it's the same result whether you narrate it or or not, what's the point? Right. Right. That's what I mean. So so we can have this like conversation where we're talking about like narrative explanation of certain stats and why they look the way that they do and things. But in reality, it boils down to this whole like I whack you, you whack me thing. So ver- so conversely, that's why I was like I definitely don't want to do that for Maximum Apocalypse. Mm-hmm. And that's why we kept that the system in place for Few and Chris because I like the idea of you want to shoot me, that's fine. Uh, but I'm going to try to get behind this rock or you want to stab me. Cool. I'm going to try to punch you in the face while you're trying to stab me. Right. Like yeah. this back and forth thing where we're, where we're opposing each other because I'm not just going to stand there and let you stab me. Now this leads into an interesting situation when you have things like sneaking up on someone. Well, okay. They don't know you're there. So in theory, they don't get to try to dodge you because they didn't know you were there. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that leads to that situation where it's like, okay, well, I can do this thing because I know that I'll probably succeed if I, as, well, as long as I'm being sneaky, um, I got all this going for me. And so, yeah, so it leads to that playing out a little bit differently. It's like, well, why did that guy just take that knife wound to the back? Because he didn't know the guy was behind him with a knife. That's why. I've, um, I've had, I've had to deal with, I've, I've been in arguments with some ridiculous situations where somehow sniping someone doesn't count, doesn't count as sniping somebody while you're in the, while you're hitting in a bush or or on a crow's nest or something, somehow doesn't count as a as a sneak attack because of how, either because of how loud a gun is or because of the fact that um, that it that it isn't it isn't sneaking up on them with a knife, right? Um, when whether it whether it's whether you're using a knife whether you're using a knife or whether you're sniping, by the time time everybody hears the sound of the bullet, your target's probably um, over there, over there. Over there, down there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and so you know we, when we were doing this kind of stuff, this was the sort of things that I did when I was creating Maximum Apocalypse, and we rolled it because like this, instead of it being like sneak attack or whatever, it's labeled as being unseen. Mm-hmm. And there's there's several ways to be unseen, right? Like being unseen is I used the stealth roll and I snuck up on them, but being unseen is also like. Yeah, I'm hiding behind this rock, and they're walking toward me. Like these are two different things. I don't necessarily need to hide. He doesn't know I'm here, and I'm behind this rock. So mm-hmm. when he gets here, I will then stab him, and I didn't have to make a roll. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. it's important. I I often I often come up to the to the whole, to the whole get to that whole Monty Python gag of how not to be seen. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And like there's there's also ways because when you have that in place, right? And this is how you make a game, really. You make a rule that you want to use and then you make it apply to both sides, right? And so I like this system that I created a lot uh, for this particular situation because I did something like in this game that I ran the other day for Quackalope where I had hidden amongst the shrubs around this particular area a whole bunch of little tiny, very annoying beasts. Um, mm-hmm. they were They were ducks who could quack and honk and make a lot of noise, which completely ruined the element of surprise for the players. Fortunately, they handled it well. But these things didn't have to make stealth rolls. They're just smaller than the bushes. So the players didn't see them until they walked up on one. And then they were like, 
oh, hey, little guy, uh, we're just going to go ahead and wrangle you up and tie you down so you don't quack and stuff. And then a bunch of the other ones just, you know, ran out from under the all of the other bushes. And they went, oh, well, good thing we didn't, uh, you know, really get into this because this might have gone really badly. <laughs> And it was like, I didn't have to make a stealth roll. These things are just small and in the trees. The players aren't going to know until they get into the trees. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Eh, with, with or without, in the words of Oasis, fucking in the bushes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know that I know I'm probably dating myself with, with that reference, but I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> And the that bring with that with that in mind, um, I know that I know that you, with the with the um, quick start you have a you have a introductory adventure, and I've covered introductory adventures for the Valley of the Judge series on the channel. I didn't do it for this one because um, it would have integrated the adventure itself, and that's not how I operate. Right, but. What I'm curious, but I'm curious if you, if there, are, if you have any plans to put in um, sto story seeds for the GM within the full book. So, like, uh, you mean like a pre-made adventures? Not pre, not pre-made adventures per se. Yeah. The a, a story seed is, assen is essentially giving a GM a act one to potentially build to potentially build around. Hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. A full on adventure, which it would be well, a full, a full on advent, a full on adventure. But these would be, uh, these would be um, events, rumors, what have you, that a GM could use as the as the crux of the campaign, or so, or something, or something a bit, or something a bit more specific. I mean, I don't have anything like that um necessarily at the moment that is actually a pretty good idea in part, the of the, part of the reason okay. i ask is because when you have with a setting like the few and curse there's so many different ways that you can ta that you can tackle um different stories that giving up that once again giving a bit of guidance goes a long way sure but is it sounds like that's something that you're considering? Yeah, I mean, now that you've said it, it's definitely good. I the, in the section for the like the game the the Trailmaster section of the book, there's definitely stuff on like um, peoples and places and things uh, and and factions um, and and settlements and territories and stuff. So there's a lot of things, but you're you've got a you've got you're talking about something that's different from that. And that's actually not a bad idea of having a few kinds of like rumors and stuff. Um, it's actually not bad. It's actually a very good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it breaks down in the Game Master section or the Trail Master section here the same way it kind of does in Maximum Apocalypse for some bits of like how to run adventures. Um, things like thinking of uh, monsters as obstacles and not as goals, right? Um, that's one thing that I think is super good about the way that Maximum Apocalypse plays out for a lot of people. I think that's one one thing that people like is that instead of like zombies being the thing, oh, we're going to go to this area and just kill all these zombies. Like that could be the objective if that's what you wanted it to be. But like the monsters are not the objective usually. Usually the objective is, well, we want to get this food out of that place, but there's a bunch of zombies in the way, right? Mm -hmm. And so that that lends itself to telling a slightly different story. So it's like, well, because the the zombies themselves are not the objective, then if we can figure out how to get past them without having to fight them, we still defeat the challenge and still get the goal. Um, and so that plays out way differently than like we have to kill all these zombies because that's the purpose here is to go kill all these zombies. Mm -hmm. um, so the same thing with cursed with cursed creatures, like like the cursed creatures are people with cursed objects right and so the goal might be might be to get the object that they have but more than likely what it is is you're trying to do a thing and they just happen to be in the way of it for some reason whether it's like you want this water 
that that this person who has a cursed object is protecting, or that person is some evil villain and wants to take down the U.S. Postal Service because of whatever beef they have with the U.S. Postal Service. And does the U.S. Postal Service has hired you to help deal with that situation? And then you find out, oh, they're also a person with a cursed object. That sucks. Um, so anyway, uh, but no, but having like having some things, you've just given me an idea, essentially, is what I'm getting at. Like, you've given me an idea for more to add to that section. Yeah. Oh. Is because I think, because when I think about the, when I think about the kind of, a lot, obviously a lot of stories that you that would fit in a spaghetti western would easily fit in the world of the few and cursed, just with a few changes. Yeah. Um, especially the more grindhouse westerns. Yes. But there, but there's the fact that there, that there's a wide there's a wide variety of types of stories that can be that can be told in. A weird west. If if you want to do the if you want to do the cop, the cops and robbers with you playing the cops or the robbers, that's one option. If you want mm-hmm. if you want to do the sort of the frontiersman thing, that's that's certainly an option. If you want to do the um the tr- the white hat, the white hat coming into town, that's <laughs> that's also an option. If you want to do f- um full on western detective, that's certainly an option, and that's just an that's just to name a few. Yeah, right. You've got train heists. You've got all kinds mm-hmm. of stuff. Yeah, we we have we have a hundred years of we- of Western stories. We have a hundred and so or so years of Western stories and films. And now, if somebody wanted to do a few and cursed version of the magnificent magnificent seven, I don't see why not. Yeah, absolutely, Could totally do that. Oh, um, or or for or for that matter, um, some something as something as weird as. Um, Sukiyaki Western Django. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I know. I know. It, I know. It's redundant when, cac- when tackling a game about the Weird West, but su- but Django was a weird movie. Where uh-huh. A bunch of imagine imagine a bunch of Japanese actors trying to do a spaghetti western, and they're all they're all having to speak English, and none of them, yeah. and for all of them, it's not their first language. Then again, yeah. it's a t- then again, it was a Takashi Miike movie, and he is weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, that's fair. But um, with that with that in with that in mind, I know that the quick start is, has been uh, has been up and running for a little while. Um, yep. When are you planning on launching the Kickstarter, and um, what are you shooting for as far as a page count, stretch goals notwithstanding? So the page count, uh, so the, the the Kickstarter actually launches on October 11th uh, at 8 a.m. I think my time. I think it's noon Eastern time. Um, maybe it's maybe it's 9 a.m. my time. Anyway, uh, on the 11th, uh, I'm not the one in charge of pressing the button, so it's a good thing I don't know when the start time is supposed to be. Uh, but at eight, on the 11th, and then the book's current page count. Well, I think we're gonna. I think it's. So like two hundred and something, maybe th- yeah, two hundred something, maybe three. Uh, the current page count I think is one fifty, and that's without any of the layout and art. Yeah, it's one fifty without the layout and art. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm sort of assuming that we're gonna have at least another probably hundred pages of that, um, especially based on the layouts that I know we're going to be using. Because this time around, it's not me and Mike doing the layout. This time around, we have Davis and Mains, who's the same layout person for the Few and Cursed comics. He's uh, we fired him on. That's why the uh, the quick start guide looks the way that it does because he did that one and this was like him testing out to see if he could do it. And then he gave us that back and we're like, yes, this is exactly right. And he was like, perfect. Mm-hmm. And so we rolled we rolled with that. So he's gonna be doing the same kind of thing with the book. So we're gonna have these cool layouts with art mixed in, um, you know, maybe quarter pages of art and then like the rest of it being writing or vice versa. Maybe a whole page of art. So I'm gonna guess that just based on that alone. Um, we're gonna have 200, a little bit over, maybe to something. But it, based on based on the stretch goals, um, w- which we do have a few planned that are just gonna be kind of automatic without actually needing to be a stretch goal, just like a timing thing. Or on a certain day, we're gonna reveal a certain thing. Um, there's gonna be another uh, goodly amount of pages. I think at least 50 more pages thrown in because of those sort of things. So 
Um, mm -hmm. I, I know of the, the ones that we're going to just do anyway are basically another 20 pages. Um, so I think it's about 50 when we get to like the stretch goals and stuff. Yeah. So my guess, if I were to guess, would be about 300 all told. Um, but that's kind of dependent on some stretch goals and also how we lay out the monsters. Because there's some debate between us and Davison and Felipe about how to lay out the monster section. And so there's sort of a discussion about whether we want to do it the same way we did with Maximum Apocalypse, where each monster essentially had their own page, or whether we want to do a more condensed version where there's like smaller pictures and more condensed stat blocks um, for the monsters so that they're because they're because and I think this has a little bit to do with like the fact that uh, a lot of the monsters have their own comics related to them. And so do we need to have like as much on the page if there's a whole comic that obviously a particular group would want you to go obtain to find out more about that monster? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure how who will win out on that particular debate, but I think it'll it'll probably be like either a compromise between the two of us, um, or it will be you know one of those two. Um, well, let let me make let me get some popcorn and 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 get and get a street team together so I can so I can so we can make money up on the inevitable fight. <laughs> no, it's cool. Like working with uh, working with Lee is actually. Kind of interesting, uh, and and this is no in no way to say anything bad about him. He's a great guy. He's a very cool guy. No, but working with him is very interesting because uh, for from his perspective, like Mike and I are basically super fans, right? We're just super fans of his comics. Uh, both of us have backed like literally every one of his Kickstarter projects related to these things, um, related to the few and cursed thing. Because he's also done like Jack, uh, One Eye Jack, and and a couple of other the the Lost Kids of Samarkand and things like that, which we didn't necessarily both back. I, I can't speak for Mike. I I backed basically all of it, um, but I don't know if he has. But we're anyway we're super fans. And so when he's talking to us about the things he does, um, kind of remember that somewhere about halfway through the discussion every time. And he's like, oh, wait, I don't want to I don't want to spoil anything for you guys. So, like, I'm just going to, like, stop talking about that, um, which which creates like a weird situation. Where I'm like, OK, but but I just I need to know because I'm making a stat block for the monster. Um, <laughs> so that kind of thing. Uh, so it's kind of fun sometimes like that. Sometimes it's like frustrating. Where I'm like, just tell me what I want to know. But other times I'm like, OK, he's, he just doesn't want to spoil it. And then uh, like that's what happened with uh, with La Rubia del Baño. Um, and then she's in. She's the the monster that happens in, in issue seven, uh, which just he just sent the PDFs out. So I was able to finish that section because there was no spoiler anymore because I could just read the issue and see what it was he was trying to hide, um, that kind of thing. But he's he's a good guy. Like he's a very very awesome dude, uh, very friendly. It's just sometimes fun to like we have to play this word game because he's trying not to spoil anything for us. Mm -hmm. So. With, so with that in, with that in mind, uh, I know you. I, I know it says on the on the preview that you, that you're shooting for, um, you're shooting for May of May of next year. Um, is that is that the plan going forward that you're that you want to try that um you want to try and get this at, on um, that month? Yeah. So we so we actually um. Mike is is great about this, and it's the thing that I picked up on for when I was doing Beta Red that I followed the same kind of plan. We actually have like our plans are actually probably going to be much sooner than the projected date. Um, we actually sort of overshoot what we think the projected date is going to be. That way, we can for sure hit that particular goal, right? Um, so the the dates that we'll that we will say for the delivery are actually probably uh, over what we will actually need, um, but we're accounting for potential issues that might arise. Like like uh, an example, Mike Mike and I had this whole discussion about the subject because he is still waiting for um, the Maximum Apocalypse, the final board game expansion, uh, the Wasted Wilds, mm -hmm. because of shipping delays that happened from China. And so we discussed in length uh, these potential shipping delays, how long he's been waiting for certain products from his various manufacturing locations. And so we, we, we sort of figured out 
based on where we were planning to do production and where we were planning to move those things and who where the warehouses were and based on all of that to sort of plan out, okay, this is what the realistic deadline looks like where as of where we are now. And then here's what it would look like if we had these same kinds of snags that we've had with these other things. So we projected that as the goal date and for sure we'll be able to hit that even if we run into snags. Mm -hmm. Well, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how to seeing how it develops and how it progresses. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean I'm really excited for it. Yeah. And it's especially timing given the given the recent Kickstarter for a for a audio companion to the uh, comic. Yeah. Well, if you uh, if you're paying attention, the uh, eighth number eight just dropped today. You and Chris number eight mm -hmm. Kickstarter launched today. Yep. Um, because you know we timed it like that. <laughs> There's a though this be madness, yet there is method in it. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, no, the audio thing was uh, was interesting, and, and like Felipe was super excited about it, and you know it was successful. Um, I backed it because I I am into it, and I wanted the audio book thing, the sort of audio drama that he was uh, rolling out with. Um, and so yeah, so we timed it. We were we were timing it to match with these other things that were going on, so that there would be these things. So there's also a comic book that is still being written and will thus interfere or not interfere, but like uh, uh, add to the world as we go, right? So I think by the time we actually deliver the product, nine will probably be either at, at, at the bare minimum at Kickstarter, um, if not our like eight being shipped out to everybody. So by that point, we will have yet even more stuff to that that will be public knowledge that people can pull from for the RPG. Mm -hmm. And I, and again, I I will be looking forward to seeing it. And I wish I wish you the best of luck once the Kickstarter launches. And in lieu, of, and to make sure that I don't jinx. Thank you. But thank you. with that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. Yeah, it's always fun coming on here mm -hmm. and you know being crazy. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Very cool. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to visit, to visit the temple and enjoy, enjoy our, bit, our bits of crazy around here. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>